Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, sounds a bit like a cathedral here, like in a church. You know, I feel like I have to preach now, but maybe I'll get to that point. Um, so, interesting, you know, uh, a year ago I was joking that it's very easy to predict the future because all you have to do is take an old business and then put smart in front of it, right? So, smart communication, smart cities, smart farming, uh, except for smart people, that's a different story. Uh, and then this year I would say, well, all you have to do to predict the future is to put artificial intelligence before it, right? So, AI cities, AI people, AI robots, AI medical. Right? And my prediction for five years from now is that all you have to do is to predict the future is to say you put human in front of it. Right? after we're done with all the tech things. I'll talk more about that. My current book just came out four weeks ago, and some of you, I think, are lucky to actually have a coupon or something like that to, to receive the book. I'm happy to sign it. I mean, it's already signed when you receive it, uh, but I can put your name on it later. We have a signing session. Welcome to come by. Of course, you can buy as many as you want on the Internet. You know. uh, there's no shortage of them. So, uh, basically, as a futurist, I just want to say, you know, as a futurist, I don't predict the future. There's really no such thing. Uh, there were great futurists like Alvin Toffler, Arthur C. Clarke that were able to predict the future. That's kind of like being Jimi Hendrix as opposed to being a guitar player. Um, my work is really about observation. Uh, it's about observing the next five years and working backwards to help companies reinvent. Now, um, just to kick this off, um, we're going to have the slides available later on my website, futurewithgert.com. Uh, you can download the whole deck in about two or three hours. And we're going to have some live polls using your mobile devices, okay? Uh, so you can actually take out your mobile right now, okay? Go to this page called minty.com, okay? It works on every mobile. You don't have to download. You don't have to log in. You don't have to give Google your life uh, to do this poll. Uh, just minty.com. It's a mobile site. And uh, once we do the poll, you will get an access code that you type into the page, okay? And then you just pick one answer and submit. That's it. Yeah. Um, so it's really uh, it's, it's a very straightforward thing, and we're going to be able to measure people's responses and feelings about things in this room, which would be like a nice sort of sentiment analysis in a very quick way. So that's menti.com. We'll go back to that in a second. So first of all, I want to say the future is better than we think. You know, when you, well, let, let's, uh, let's take Trump outside of that equation. We'll talk uh, in a minute, but uh, the future is better than we think because many of us are worried about the future. And I, I go to lots of places to talk about the future, and many people are saying they're worried about robots taking our jobs or, you know, robots killing us and, you know, all these things. So if we leave out the Hollywood stories of uh, world domination of robots, we actually have many, many good things to look forward to. Here's a list provided by my colleague, um, Frank Diana. Uh, basically, you know, if you're looking on the left, we're going to see ubiquitous information. We're going to see the solution of world's problems like diseases being solved, eliminated, increased longevity, the shift in energy. I mean, we're talking about a vast amount of scientific accomplishments finally actually happening. Take a very trivial one like uh, machine language understanding. I mean, we've been working on this for, I don't know, 50 years. It's finally working. Machines can actually understand what we're saying in most languages. And they can actually talk to us now. So in a year or two, we're going to be talking to machines just like we're doing the typing now. And it becomes normal. So imagine that, you know, you can actually speak to a machine, as some people would say, like a friend, which is a, a, a strange formulation. But in any case, you can communicate with machines like this. So I think that's really positive. But then we have a couple of things that are an issue. Right? Technological unemployment, uh, fake friendships, dehumanized societies pandemics, loss of free will, if you believe that to be a problem. So there is a few things around us that worry us about the future. Right now I would say it's roughly 90% positive, 10% troublesome. I don't know if you agree, but I think what we need to do is we need to make sure that technology remains a solid human benefit, a purpose, is the benefit of people. And we have to make sure that 10% of issues don't grow to be 50%. That, that could be a problem, especially, for example, unemployment and application, automation, censorship, surveillance. We need some common sense for this. You know, because as you know, technology is morally neutral 
until we apply it. William Gibson, science fiction author, said this is very important. Everything you're doing here in the smart port, the smart city, and the smart whatever, right, needs to be weighed against that benefit. And of course, you know, this is all, of course, the world used to be a much better place before Trump came around. So, so I may have to adjust this to be 1090 when he comes to power, but we'll talk about that in January. Um, very important to realize as a future, as I talk about this all the time, the future is not just an extension of the present. In fact, it used to be. We used to be able to say, well, we did this in the past, and now in the future we're going to do that and just make a little bit better. Like the car companies. German car companies are very well known for making things better, for production, but they didn't see the automated autonomous driving. They didn't see an electric car coming. They kind of did, kind of ignored it, but now they're there. So the future actually is quite different than the present. In many cases, you could say it's quite likely most companies in 10 years either won't exist or most of their business will be in other areas. I mean, Apple is a great example. Apple makes about 60% of their revenues now from the iPhone. And as you know, we've bought enough iPhones, right? So Apple is going to have to reinvent in seven years. It's probably going to be money or medical or health, right? Constant reinvention. It's a great book by Kevin Kelly, one of my mentors from San Francisco, who says that the world is all about becoming something now. It's kind of a strange thing. But we're constantly becoming something else. Uh, and that is a real challenge, I think, in technology, but many things. So we're looking at this, it's, you know, we're living in an exponential world. The world is changing exponentially fast. Things that used to be science fiction are science fact, some of them. I mean, if you're a scientist, I apologize. I, I think in many ways you could say that it's probably overly optimistic. But some people, like this company in California called Human Longevity, Inc., this is not a joke, actually exists, right? Their goal is to end dying, right? And I mean, they're from California, but still, you know, it's a serious goal, right? Uh, to end dying, to end aging, they've just raised $400 million so that we can all live to be 150 years old, if we have the money, of course. Right? So this is uh, something that's happened. We are at the pivot point of this exponential change. We're, we're not in the beginning of the curve, we're at the takeoff point. So if you're my age, you're going to see changes that are probably further out than anything that you've seen in science fiction in the last 20 years. Uh, in fact, many things depicted in science fiction are already becoming true, like automatic language translation, uh, telepresence, holograms. Are we going to be able to defeat cancer in 20 years through genetic manipulation? Possibly, but then we can also have superhumans. So who's going to decide if, how that's being done and what we're going to do? I mean, clearly, it is very dangerous to keep on thinking linear. And as humans, we have no choice. You know, we are linear. We are organic. Right? We, we cannot live exponentially. If we, if we do, we, we die. Right? I mean, we cannot just add information to ourselves. We're limited in that way. Humans are not exponential. So what we need to do is we have to be able to imagine an exponential world, to imagine that. If you have kids, this is the most important thing you can teach your kids. Don't expect five years just to be a little bit further along. It's actually going to be, according to Moore's law, it's going to be at least 16 times or 30 times as far. If you go on with the exponential curve, it becomes vertical. 30 times is a billion times as far. We're going to see computers in roughly eight years that have the capacity of the human brain. In 2050, we'll have one computer have the capacity of all human brains. Imagine what we could do about smart at that point. We're going to have machines that have an IQ of 500,000. And they'll be as cheap as my iPhone, which is not cheap, but eventually it will be. So the future really is... Uh, a challenge in many ways because it's also not just exponential, it's also combinatorial. Everything that we see around us is happening now at the same time. So you, you could spend all your day, like I do, on looking at these things and combining them. And we have things like uh, energy, education, smart cities, automation, connected healthcare, and there's like the list goes on. And if you see it like this, if you put them together, they all influence each other. 
So if you're talking about uh, smart ports and smart cities and smart logistics, you're talking about energy, and you're talking about politics, you're talking about 3D printing, you're talking about automation, you're talking about AI, and it's all impacting each other. So that's actually quite a complicated topic. In many ways, you could say it's like warp drive. Right? You hit the button and it just goes boom, and you know, all of a sudden, all these things are changing. I mean, I used to be in the music business. In the music business, it's, it's mind-boggling to see what has happened, you know, mostly because of the uh, stupidity of the executives. But uh, in general, in the music business now, basically, you don't sell music anymore. Music is free. Well, if you buy Spotify, it's not free, but that's 21 million songs for 8 euros. You know, we used to pay 25 euros for one album. But talk about warp drive. Uh, the music industry has to completely reinvent because selling music is no longer a business. There you're very lucky with a port. Because it'll be a long time before physical products evaporate. They may eventually be reduced by 3D printing and virtual things, but physical things will be there a long time. So that's much, much better than the music business. You actually have a real physical outlet. But here's what we have to understand in, in terms of society. My book talks about this elaborately. We used to be able to take business and culture and society and put them in separate places. So if you were a company, you were, you were essentially an organization, technology was part of it, but everybody lived in their clean bubbles. And that changed about five years ago, and now we have this, right? Now we're living in a world where everything that you do has societal consequences, changes people's behavior, has impact on politics, right? It's completely all one thing. And that's the sweet spot, right? We have to get used to a sort of uh, holistic vision of what the future does. For example, when we think about smart things, we have to think about energy. And I'll tell you a minute what's happening with energy, but clearly you know uh, which way we're going. And then this is the question. I mean, I can, I can guarantee you, if all you're doing is technology, you're becoming a commodity. I mean, look at the telephone companies, the mobile operators. Right? I mean, yes, they're getting cheaper and faster all the time, but you know, they're a commodity, basically. So how do you put the human inside? How do you make sure that there's human purpose? I think it's a big discussion that you see currently raging about how we will do this and this kind of idea that has been around for a long time, you know, people, planet, profit, the triple bottom line, as Jeremy Rifkin likes to talk about. I think you heard him before speaking. He's a good colleague of mine. And very true, he's been talking about that for 30 years. Right? But finally, we're here, right? We're finally going to be at the point where people, planet, profit is a business model. I would suggest to you that basically sustainable is the new profitable. That's only five years away. Five years ago, sustainable was a pain. And Bertolt Brecht once said a uh, long time ago that dinner first, then morals. That's changing now. Now, digital ethics, what has to do with how we use technology, is becoming a centerpiece, it's becoming a big story. So I think it's going to be very important to look at this in the future. Now, quickly about energy. We heard this earlier, and I think many of you are, are in that business at this point. 84% of the world's energy is coal, nuclear, gas, oil, you know, fossil fuels. 84%. In some countries, of course, in Switzerland and Germany, it's a different relationship of how that is happening. But we know what the future is. Now, research shows quite clearly, uh, I don't know if you, if you believe that research, but Roughly 20 years from now, we'll be able to cover the world's energy supply with solar energy, 100%. That is the estimation. You can argue that in various cases, and what's going to happen to oil is quite clear. We will still need oil, but not like we do today. In the music business, where, where I grew up, right, we still need record labels, but we don't need them like they used to be. So what's happening here is quite clearly, if you believe OPEC, you see those numbers? I don't know anybody in this room would believe OPEC, but they're predicting that not much is going to change, right? We're going to keep on driving cars with gas engines. You know, this is basically wishful thinking. I, that is uh, putting it mildly, right? I mean, Toyota just announced they're going to stop making cars with gas engines in 15 years, and they really mean five years. I would advise you, if you have a nice car with a gas engine, Sell it. 
Now, I just sold mine. Because right? in five years, nobody, I guarantee you, nobody is going to want a car with a gas engine unless they are a passionate collector like vinyl. Right? And here's the forecast on solar energy. It's actually moving up a little bit, roughly 20 years until solar is at that point where we can actually use it for it. It's going to be cheap enough, we're going to have batteries. And Tesla, of course, is a major driver behind this. So here's the question, of course, we need to have a sort of a hybrid thinking. Right? This is the key to our future success. Hybrid thinking means you do whatever is needed today, because you can't just leave. You know, obviously, you're making money with what is happening today, whether you're a bank or insurance company or a medium. And you have today think of what you do today, but then think about what you want to do tomorrow that's not here. Some people would call that dualistic or possibly schizophrenic. So Gary Hamill said, the, big, the single biggest reason that companies fail is they overinvest in what is and underinvest in what isn't. This is a very hard thing to do, especially when you're making a boatload of money. The best example is the pharma business. Do you really believe that we're going to sit here 10 years from now and take pills for cholesterol, you know, statins, or for high blood pressure? Or we're going to do the treatment of diabetes as we do today? In 10 years, that is over. It's beyond the pill. Well, we're talking about $14 trillion a year of revenues, right? So how do you do that? How do you think about today and tomorrow at the same time? This is very important. First of all, we have to realize science fiction is becoming science fact. Everything is getting connected. The connected car was science fiction, is becoming reality. Robots that can actually do stuff that only humans used to do. Right? This is Boston Robotics owned by Google, of course. I guess they own everything that has to, but I think they're just getting rid of this company. Uh, the possibility of every surface becoming a screen, and of course, falling in love with technology. 40% of American kids, if you ask them who is your best friend, you know what they say? My mobile phone. Now, that is truly pathetic, right? Uh, well, I, I don't know if it would be any different in Switzerland or in Holland, <laughs> but that's kind of a strange notion, right? So we're going into a world where we're becoming superhuman, right? I mean, technology makes us superhuman, like God. Right? I mean, we're going to become even more like God when we can program our own body. I'm not religious, so I don't want to touch that subject, really. But this is kind of what it feels like. You know, we're, we're taken off now to a future that is uh, science fiction, science fact, really changing. And part of that is because now we're in the age of tech. You know what used to matter most for politics, for money, for economies, was oil and banking. Right? The left. In 10 years, what matters most about our society is not the oil companies. In fact, of course, you know where they're going. It will just take be a matter of time to follow the record labels. Uh, we're going to this future. Data companies, technology companies, platform providers, artificial intelligence companies, they are leading the world, the age of tech. And you know, that if you continue this, there's one lonely oil company here. Continue this, the next 20 companies are Chinese. So this future is basically going to be about information. You could say that data is the new oil, and it must be and it will be regulated like oil. Right now, as you know, data is completely unregulated. Well, for obvious reasons, it's just happened too fast, and it's happening in the U.S. So that will change tremendously. I think that we're going to see this. So technology is rapidly changing what we think of as normal. Research shows that if we had Uber cars in New York, roughly 9,000 autonomous cars, we could just have Uber and not have any regular cabs in terms of the economics, and it would still be cheaper. Whether we would want that, I doubt it, because they're also becoming a bit of a monopoly, or they're definitely not good for drivers. Right? But this is basically reality that we're looking at. Uh, what is normal today will not be normal tomorrow. And that we have to imagine where this can go. We cannot, we're facing the, uh, the sort of global game changers that all of you know about, but it bears repeating. Our world is changing rapidly. We should not be afraid of this, except for that being a little bit worried is probably a good thing sometimes. But we should not be afraid of that future. So 
primarily robots, robots and artificial intelligence will become as normal as SMS or WhatsApp. That is a future that is certain. The Internet of Things, the blockchain, which is a, a peer to peer encrypted protocol that is able to transmit data on high frequencies, and 3D printing. All these things have been mentioned years ago, didn't work. That doesn't mean that they won't work in the future. And I keep hearing this every day. You know, people are saying, well, you know, the Industrial Revolution cost a lot of jobs, made a lot of jobs, and so in the end it came out okay, and it'll be the same now. That is a very big mistake. There's no such thing, there's no such logic. Just because it was in the past, then it's going to happen in the, in the same future, in the same way. I mean, yeah, there's some interesting conversations we can have around this, but this is a change of framework, as McLuhan says. And the blockchain is one of those driving factors. So I want to uh, share with you five new economies that are impacting ports and shipping before I move on to some of the other stuff. First is the maker economy. Distributed manufacturing, again, been discussed for 10 years, never really happened, not in that sense, but now it will. Printing food, printing engine parts, printing all kinds, including body parts, earlobes, already happening. Not that you need a container ship to transport earlobes, but... So we're going to have a lot of changes in that regard. On demand, the sharing economy, what's called disownership. Right? Not owning stuff, but sharing stuff. For example, now people are sharing offices, not, not renting one. Very big trend. The circular economy, recycling everything, a kind of a sustainable capitalism. Right? That has also been discussed for a long time. The experience economy. Chinese consumers are no longer coming to Switzerland to buy five Rolexes every two years. They're going on trips to the Amazon. They're renting an Airbnb in Greenland or a treehouse. They want to experience something. That is really changing with the millennials. And the gig economy. The fact that we're going to work in many different places in many different ways without having a fixed job. That's kind of normal in the US already. In Switzerland, it's 2% of Swiss people where I live that are working in the gig economy. That is going to be over 50% in 10 years. This is a mind-boggling change. That means you can make a lot of money by being the right guy or right woman at the right time, but security, yeah, that's... In Europe, we, we are not so happy about that development, and if there aren't any rights with the gig economy, any protection, I think that's probably not a good thing for us. But, as I was saying earlier, literally everything is becoming connected and intelligent. Right? So we have the smart maker machine that basically makes everything smart <laughs> that we can see at work here. Uh, we have robotics everywhere. And we have to ask a question, is that going to be heaven or hell? Well, if you're in the business of selling those smart maker machines, of course it would be heaven. Right? But there are some other side effects that we need to think about. I call this hell then, you know, hell and heaven. If you're on Twitter, you can check out the hashtag Hellven and tells you more about this. Like the fourth industrial revolution, cyber physical systems. I think to a very large degree, extremely positive developments, but also many other ones like sometimes we don't know what automation does, called automation bias. Sometimes we don't know if we can trust the machine or not. We're going to live in a world of robotics, as all these quotes are saying. The future is where there are as many robots as cars and phones. I mean, that's going to really change our society in many ways. Just watch Black Mirror if you want an uh, imitation of this. The Cambrian explosion in robotics. Incredible machine diversification. That's really going to impact our world, how we live. So I want you guys to do some voting now. Okay, take out your weapons, okay, and just go to menti.com and put in this code, please. And I can see if I can get the live result cooking here. I hope the internet is still working. That's good, it is. You can prove that you're future-proof now uh, by doing this. So go to menti.com and put in this code, 6152. One six. Now I know there's about 200 people here or something, so if I don't see 200 votes, it says up there, 615216. You can only vote once, okay? <laughs> only. If you do the next vote, you have to re refresh the page and put another code in. 
okay? And this will give us a good overview. The question is really quite simple. How do you feel about these exponential changes? Very simple question. Ah, there's one thinking that we're heading into a dystopian future. Let me guess who that was. <laughs> Well, I didn't vote, but it, it's good to see some dissenters here. Obviously, you're wildly optimistic, which is good. We'll do the vote again after I speak, and then you can decide if you're going to recast your vote. Okay, of course, the answers I've given you are already kind of a, a tilted focus group, but it's still interesting to see that we have a vastly positive view in the future. I like that. I'd love to hear the answers from the uh, people who think it's mostly trouble. We should discuss it later when we have the forum, because uh, we'll have some time to talk about those concerns. I keep this running. You can keep on voting, uh, but I will turn to the slides in a minute. We will publish the slides later on as well, including the, uh, this, very, this very result here. So in this giant brain that's being formed, you know, basically, uh, all of the technology companies around us are forming giant global brains, you know, putting all the information in a central place. And in fact, you could say what is happening is that technology is creating a copy of us in the sky. So Facebook is making a copy of me. Uh, Facebook has roughly 25, 30 million records on each of us. And so is Google, and so is everybody else that has a chance to do so. And I call this the mega shifts. You know, there's about 10 of them. They're actually laid out in my book pretty well. But the mega shifts are impacting all of our future. And I would say if you look at these, you can have your pick and say, how is that going to impact smart ports and shipping and logistics? I clearly, in many cases, quite positive, and in other cases, quite scary. For example, anything that can be automated will be automated. That's the law of digital Darwinism. I mean, look at what happened to the music business. The record labels refused and they sued 285,000 people for submission to buy CDs and to keep on spending, but now music is digital, it's in the cloud. Right? So the future quite clearly shows what's happening here is, I think the convergence of man and machine, you know, if you go back to those words here, that all points in the same direction, the convergence of man and machine, machine is years away, not decades. So if you think that you won't be touched because you're too old, you're mistaken. In five years, we're going to be at that point where technology can do things that we thought of as unbelievable, implausible. And I would still submit that's mostly positive if we find a way to navigate those waters, if we actually think about this. I mean, the dramatic datafication of shipping and ports and logistics is inevitable. If you refuse that, you won't be in business. So what you have to figure out is what, how do we create values? What is the social contract? around this process? Well, this is an important question. Right? When you talk about the future of humanity is what is the social contract and how, what are our ethics? Because right? it's quite clear technology doesn't have ethics and neither should it. Do we want a robot to have ethics? Do we want a computer to understand feelings or actually feel? We don't need that. Right? A computer that can think, like a computer, is plenty useful. Cognitive computing, that artificial intelligence, they don't have to be like us. Let them think like they think. That's just fine because they're tools, right? Technology is a tool. It's not a purpose. An other person is a relationship or a purpose, right? It's not my wife isn't a tool like my computer is a tool. Right? Let's not confuse the two. We ultimately have an issue of ethics that we have to decide where it's going. Again, the hell van scenario. Right? Thinking about things like ethics, stewardship, responsibility, collaboration. So hyper technology will drive us to the place where we have to think, for example, about security. I mean, we're going to be so deeply connected like a thousand X of today, security becomes a major issue. Not just security in a technical sense, but also in a political sense, standards, rules, collaboration, we're going to need non-proliferation agreements, for example, on artificial intelligence. That's a discussion that's being had right now. So we need some stewardship, and I think many of us will be involved in that process, because once everything is connected, we have to figure out, are you on team human, or are you on team robot? Okay. And the answer is simple. Sometimes you're going to be on team robot, because that's the nature of work, right? 
I mean, clearly every large company in the world wants to fire as many people as possible because that's how you increase the margin. That's what automation does. That's what makes it efficient. Right? So sometimes we are on team robot, but in general we have to think about what is the purpose of what we're doing? Does it provide human happiness or flourishing, you could say? And so what's happening right now, we can clearly see already we're moving into this world of where technology is merging with humanity. And as the CEO of Google said, uh, we're moving from mobile to artificial intelligence. Google will no longer be a search company. They will be a company searching inside my brain, literally. Well, they're already doing that. Right? <laughs> That's not necessarily a bad thing, but you know, there's lots of responsibility that comes with this shift. Imagine a thinking machine with an IQ of 50,000. What would that do to shipping? You could feed the entire 50 years of data into this machine, like a trillion data sets. And all of the predictions of currencies and, and fossil fuels and consumption, and it would come out and would say, if you do the following, you can save 40% of expenses. Currently, you can't really do that. It's utterly complicated. But the future will hold this. Right? Machines that can do this in an eerie way. And then we have to decide, do we believe them? Do we happily slap the robot, congratulate ourselves to the accomplishment? Right? The Internet of Things is a great example. If we do this, we're going to connect roughly a trillion sensors. Huge economic benefits, but also a huge if issue of surveillance. Eh? And who is in charge of all that? Who is mission control of the Internet of Things? IBM has a, an artificial intelligence that is a, a pretending to be a lawyer called Ross. Any lawyers in the room? Take cover. A super intelligent attorney, that is kind of an oxymoron, I suppose, but, but that is their proposition, right? We don't need an attorney, we just go to the AI and the AI will figure out if I lose or win. My colleague Paul Sappho likes to say, let's not confuse a clear view with a short distance. Many of these things will happen, but they're not quite here yet. And we have to observe and also be careful about this because this huge premise or promise that machines can learn I think it's extremely powerful. If we don't understand how that works, we may be missing the boat, but if we believe it too much, and we talk about cognitive shipping, as some people have in sentient, sentient ports, ports that can think. Give me some sound. Volumes of data. Whether we consider a doctor diagnosing a patient, a wealth manager advising a client on their retirement portfolio, or even a chef creating a new recipe, they need new approaches to put into context the volume of information they deal with on a daily basis in order to derive value from it. This process serves to enhance human expertise. Watson and its cognitive capabilities mirror some of the key cognitive elements of human expertise. Systems that reason... You get the point. If you watch IBM Watson on YouTube, you can get a lot more of this. But as I said, don't mistake a clear view for a short distance. <laughs> I think that may be coming, but when exactly that is still sort of up in the stars. But what is clearly happening is technology is now creating scenarios that have a lot to do with prediction. Predictive analytics. I mean, these topics are vast for your industry. Logistics and prediction. Well, there are some reports uh, saying that we could save 40% of logistic costs if we were able to predict and, and connect everything. And that would be very hard to do with equipment that's 50 years old, obviously. And so a lot of those things, we're going to leave this out because I want to have enough time on this, uh, but I want to move to the final slide. So anything that can be digitized or automated will be. That is good news and bad news. Bookkeepers, check out in the supermarket, some truck drivers, uh, probably pilots. We should talk to Lufthansa about this today. Uh, so all these things will be clearly, um, for example, call centers. There's roughly 74 million people working in call centers. They will be 98% automated because call centers are not, you know, human emotion isn't a big qualifying factor of call centers, right? <laughs> so the reverse is also true, and that's good news for us. Right? Anything that cannot be automated or digitized becomes extremely valuable. Now ask yourself that question, what cannot be digitized or automated? Well, there's a thousand things, right? Everything that matters to us 
is very hard to, optim to automate. Right? Happiness cannot be automated. Trust cannot be automated. Emotions, compassion, empathy, imagination, intuition. Yeah, you can probably mirror them or simulate them, but automate them, I think it's an important question. And then, the, and then we have to ask the question, why are we doing all these things? And I, I keep hearing from our clients that this is the, the goal of everything is to be efficient. This is utterly wrong. That is what the CFO likes. That is not the purpose of business is to be efficient. The purpose of business is customer delight, happiness, right? customer happiness, our happiness. If you pursue efficiency, that's a good goal because it makes money, obviously. But that's not the ultimate reason why we do smart things. If that was the case, we'd become a machine. Because imagine this, we are utterly inefficient. We lie, we make mistakes, we do stupid stuff, we have to sleep, we actually have to go to the bathroom. We are so inefficient as, as, a, as a machine that we wouldn't exist in a world that's about efficiency. So we have to think about where this is going. We have to also be aware of this kind of idea that everything is a machine, right? This machine thinking. It's, we have to use technology to achieve this, but ultimately we have to go beyond this. Otherwise, we end up in a place that has automation bias and what's called judgment erosion. Lots of incidents already all around us where uh, humans think that machines can actually do this, and they really can't. Right? We have to be very careful about this. I think machines will be able to do a lot more things in the future. There's no doubt about that. Right? But does it take us out of the picture? I don't believe it. This is a very important question, of course, for our own work. You know? So the question really is, what should or what should not be automated? And the answer is, if you don't automate what can be automated, that could spell trouble, because right? you won't be competitive. But if you automate trivial stuff like this, right? human emotions, relationships, that's also a bad idea. For example, self-driving cars, there's nothing wrong with automating driving. Uh, driving a car isn't a human right. You know, it's something we did for 50 years, and now it's over. You know? Okay, so bad luck. You lose your fun of driving. It's not material. But partner selection or medical decisions about your kids, those are human things that we shouldn't automate. We shouldn't say that we're not going to have this child just because our DNA isn't a 100% clean match. I mean, those questions are really difficult questions, right? We're going to have to think about this, what we automate, what we do not automate. Because now we're heading into a world, some people, of you, some of you may have heard about the singularity, right? That's the point in time when machines become as powerful as we are. Uh, in mechanical terms, that's 40 quadrillion calculations per second, roughly, that our, uh, that our brain does. So we're, we're at this point now, consider yourself lucky because you're at the takeoff point. You don't have to wait very long for that to happen. Some people say roughly 70 years, seven years, and then post-human society, right? Some people say. So basically I would say, you know, keeping humans in the loop is essential. And that may include some inefficiencies. Why would we not include human inefficiencies in a business model? Then we can take ourselves out. Right? So a smart port, I think, would also consider this in the thinking machines, the cognitive computing. But in the end, machines don't think like we do. Because there's one tiny problem. There's one tiny problem with this. As Daniel Kahneman likes to say, Nobel Prize winning psychologist, we don't think with the brain. Cognition is embodied. We think with everything that we have. It would be too simple if we just said, okay, we just have a machine doing that thinking for us. Let machines do the thinking that they are best at, which is a trillion facts and deciding what is likely to happen. And so that is enough. And, and that's going to really change our business. So basically, in this world, you know, some people feel like we're already becoming useless humans. I don't know how you feel about this. I think what's really happening is we're moving up the food chain. All the work that's routine we're going to give up. That's not bad news, except for if your job is routine. Of course, then it could be a problem. Eh? But we must also cherish the human things. So when you think about the smart port, what are people going to do? This is what we're going to talk about in the skills section later. 
and how we're going to actually get to this. I think this is a very important point. As Klaus Schwab said uh, just a few months ago, we must put human beings at the center of the system. Right? Create something that values in cultural revolution as well as an industrial one. So when you're talking about smart ports and smart cities, you're talking about a cultural revolution. Right? Not just a technology revolution. That's very important to keep in mind, I think, for us. The world really looks like this in the future. I call this algorithms and andro rhythms, which are human things, uh, converging. I think it's very important to realize where we are going with this, because once we reach peak efficiency, then it's actually important to become human again, and to have human purpose. So I'll summarize with a couple statements. Machines are for answers, humans are for questions. This is a very important realization. Let the machines do the answers for what they can actually answer, when they can answer, which is increasingly happening. We need to ask questions. Because asking questions is the hard part. Right? We need to ask questions, for example, like IKEA says, we are hiring wise sayers. Right? This is a fantastic ad. Imagine that, you know, most companies don't want wise sayers because they're paying the butt. Right? I think if you are a pain now, you'll be happy in the future. You'll have a job in the future because you can ask questions. You know, in the U.S., they sometimes say if your job can be described, a robot will take it. Right? I think it's not quite as extreme. You know, they like to put things extremely in the U.S. But just to summarize, so we're looking at this tectonic shift, you know, this, this VUCA reality of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and that's our future. There's no way around this, especially in your business, changing all the time. New scientific breakthroughs and so on. We have to respond with a new paradigm. I call this flipping the VUCA. Velocity, unorthodoxy, co-creation, and abundance. And just by being here at this event, I can tell that velocity, velocity is something that's happening here, which is great. Co-creation, right? unorthodoxy, inventing new things without thinking so much about why you shouldn't. That, that's becoming a very, very crucial skill. So um, just to finish this up, I think here's sort of my view on the future. First, I think good technology and strong technology and, you know, technology that is useful for humans becomes important. But also putting the human back inside and defining what that is. How will you be on Team Human? Why do people do business with you? People are not interested in doing businesses with giant algorithms. Business, after all, it's still done between people. So David Bowie, rest in peace, used to say, the future belongs to those who can hear it coming. And I think you can because you're here today, and I wish you a nice rest of the day and look forward to our discussion. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerd Leonard. It was Thank wonderful you. listening to you. Thank you. One question, how will we be making money by selling